Hey, what's up? This is Mark Lopes from Metal Church of Rasta Boss Band. Let us pray. And you'll listen to Aftershocks TV. And for, don't forget to keep it fucking metal. Yeah. heaviness of leeway they just came on and the place started going crazy it came from the, the streets in the bowery cbgb but started going crossover with the addition of heavy metal members i think they just changed the game for new york hardcore new york crossover whatever you want to call it rise and fall came on and i was just like whoa they're just classics, and not just New York hardcore classics to me, they're just classic records, you know, metal hard rock records. I mean, they had everything going for them. The great front man, they had the two shredding guitars. Leeway was the Berlin Wall between punk and metal. A huge inspiration to the band Enrage, my band, I was truly blown away. Again, you know, coming from the standpoint of a metalhead, uh, I thought it was cool, it was different, and um, it was definitely aggressive, and I dug it. I thought they were just going to be a massive, massive band. Um, Eddie is a front man, the, the guitar tones on those records and the playing, the dual guitar thing. No telling what they could have done if it wasn't for un the unfortunate, you know, typical music business bullshit that usually gets in the way of a lot of these bands' uh, potential for success. Some of the best times of my life and definitely Leeway was a big, big part of that. To be successful in this business, you have to be willing to do anything to get there. Sometimes even anything was never enough. All right, after Shocks TV, we got a great one for everybody today. This fine gentleman that's joining me today on this episode, <laughs> you knew is the wild haired guitar maestro from the legendary New York City crossover Kings Lee Wade. He wants everyone to know. That he sucks too, by the way. Michael Gibbons is with me. Mike, where does that come from? The Michael Gibbons sucks thing. It reminds me of that Prince <clears throat> sucks thing from back in the year, back in the day. Uh yeah, it started. It actually started way back in the uh, the, the mid to late '80s with my friend. And, uh, you see it on Facebook, Rob Castoria. Uh -huh. We we always used to outrank each other, like like you suck, you suck, and and he's a killer, <laughs> amazing, great guitar player. So uh, he he played with uh, Marauder. He just he toured uh, mm -hmm. with Agnostic Front recently. He just racked up a tour with AF. He played with Marauder. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he's uh mainly known for Metal Storm, the first original Metal Storm out of Queens back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. But uh, Rob's nice. a great guitar player, so we were always we were always like two two local shredders, so we always were like, you know, you suck, you suck, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's been lasted 35 years or so. Wow, oh, it's damn. funny. So that's been going on for years. Okay, I just see it all the time with, with this, this Michael Gibbons sucks thing. I'm like, man, well, I'm just curious to where that came from, but anyway, man, so cool, Michael. Let's talk about it, man. We got, uh, you know, uh, you just got the brand new documentary that just came out called Leeway, The Forgotten Ones. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. Forgotten Ones? I mean, you think you guys are forgotten? Or was it that a lot of people just didn't know about you because of all the shit you had to deal with with profile and your management and all that shit, you know? But, but just talk a little bit about The Forgotten Ones, you know, how you came up with the name and how... This came to fruition. Just go ahead and and, and tell the audience. You know, when I, when I think about it, I I, I the, the the name could have been a little bit more more appropriate. But you're right because it's not like we were forgotten. We weren't even known yet. We mm. weren't even known enough to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. But yeah. like in a way, it's sort of like a band that was just passed over constantly because of the people that we had our what that we did business with. Mm. You know, the record label was horrible, and our management was horrible. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have the opportunities presented to us that other bands had that, you know, who went on to bigger things and better things and, and you know, became a lot more well-known mm -hmm. than Leeway. Like, you know, 
uh, from the uh, New York hardcore scene, the crossover scene, et cetera, et cetera. Like the shirt you're wearing, Prong, for instance. Mm. You know, the Prong used to support us, open up for us all the time. And then, sure. you know, they, they signed the Epic and boom, opening for Ozzy, you know, supporting Ozzy on the U.S. tour. And, you know, the guys like Prong, sick of it all, mm -hmm. uh, Biohazard, uh, you, you know, um, all these bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, well, that's what I was going to say is because, I mean, you guys are still – I mean, you're making still fans. I mean, left and right these days because of those two classic records, Born to Expire and Desperate Measures. Um, and you know, I think it's one of the one of the coolest things too about Leeway as a fan is talking with other fans about which record is better, right? Because they're both classic records. I think everyone really agrees. To, you know, anyone who loves Leeway knows that. I mean, they love both records. Um, but obviously, it's it's um, it's really interesting. Like you know, I mean, just the questions. You know, in terms of which one's better. I mean, it's always a great topic of debate. Versus personally, I'm a Desperate Measures guy. You know, I'm, I'm sort of in a maybe the minority there because most people are all about Born to Expire, even though yeah. I love that. But I just think the songwriting was just a, just a little bit better on on you know <clears throat> on Desperate Measures. I think just because obviously as a band you, you're growing together more. I know you know you joined I believe right before Born to Expire, right? So it's sort of like you had now more time. To be with the band as well to be more involved i'm sure with the writing and everything what's your take on those records what's your what would you pick if, if you could choose one desperate measures without a doubt okay okay you know i you know i i uh, participated in the songwriting and the composing and uh you know i was you know right before we recorded born to expire i came into the band in september of 87 we recorded born to expire in november of 87 so mm. These songs are already written and prepared. All we all we did was rearrange them into a more of a crossover fashion. Okay. But like when I started writing the material for Desperate Measures uh, with AJ, I, we geared it in more of a metal direction. I know that disappointed some fans originally, like the Born to Expire fans. But mm. I wanted it to go metal because uh, you know metal was a much bigger scene. There was mm. more chances of success if you were a metal band. You know, uh, hardcore didn't have the audience. You could the hardcore didn't have the reachability or the audiences like heavy metal worldwide, you know. Mm -hmm. And metal just had such huger fan bases all over the world. Hardcore was just you know the local scene of each city, and that's great and, and everything. But you know, mm -hmm. Born to Explore was crossover, and uh, you know, Desert Measures was definitely a little more speed metalish. Sure. Well, that, well, that's the thing. That's the other debate, right? Not only just which record is better, but it's also. And I don't think it should be a debate, but to, you know, um, but it's it's what is Lee? Were they a, a hardcore, you know, band or were they a metal band? And like I've always said, it shouldn't even be a debate. I mean, sure, there's there's many elements of hardcore in terms of like you said, in terms of the speed and the energy and the lyrics. But you guys were just to me a strip three. It's a thrash metal band, in my opinion, with a guitar prodigy who could do things on the guitar that not a lot of people could do, like yourself. And you had a great showman, a frontman, and Eddie, you know, who could not just get up there and run around but he could actually sing um which you know there's not many not many hardcore bands had all those pieces you know those skills to do all that um like i said maybe maybe you know the Cormags were a great band but they didn't have a front man like eddie they didn't have a lead guitarist like yourself uh they were more punk influenced as well where you, like i said you guys were more to me you were more prong crumb suckers than agnostic front and Cormags. you know well, no, no. I, Right, yeah. I mean, I just never thought of punk at all when the name Leeway came up, you know. So, See, um, yeah. Well, Leeway, Leeway originated from the New York hardcore scene by playing CBGBs first, and mm -hmm. you know they played to a hardcore audience. You know, you know, as um, AJ and Eddie were were former skinheads. You know, they mm -hmm. they, they 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 lived that lifestyle, and that's great. Um, you know, but you know, when I when I heard the demo and I heard the guitar sound on. Uh, Enforcer, I was like, wow, this band is a crossover band. I, I remember saying to the drummer at the time, you ever need a guitarist, you let me know. Mm -hmm. And a year yeah. later, I was in the band, thankfully. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, that's the thing, too. And the other thing, too, uh, Leeway, was you guys were known for bringing, as they always said, the suburban metalheads to these to these shows, right, to a lot of the hardcore shows. I mean, that was the whole crossover thing anyway, right? It was when you had the oil and water, the – the skin, you know, the the you know, hardcore skinheads versus the long haired metalheads, and you guys were one of those bands that really were responsible for bringing that together. You know, you you, you guys were obviously really. I think the difference between you and a lot of other hardcore bands was that you guys were really big outside of New York City. You know, if you was Long Island or Jersey or upstate or wherever, just 
on the, at the, on the you know the outer boroughs is where you guys also um prospered where i think you know and a lot of the the the, the city bands you know uh, within new york city were kind of just they just wanted to play cbgbs they just wanted to play in you know the, the local you know more of the hardcore punk clubs where you yes. guys really helped bring a lot of that crossover into new york and bring those suburban fans metal fans to hardcore shows correct yeah, to an extent, they, like they, like a lot of the hardcore bands wanted to stay within, uh, you know, CBs A Seven, mm -hmm. ABC Rio, the Pyramid, like, and that's great, you know. But 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 uh, you know, when you say that we were well known outside of the <laughs> outside of the city and in the five birds, you could have fooled me. I I don't I ne I never in my life over all these years ran into people that have heard of leeway. I'd run into guys and they'd be like. You know, like where I work for, where I worked for years, for instance, I got guys to be like, oh, I remember that hardcore thing, the cross, uh, Gorilla Biscuits and this and that and Chrome Mags. Yeah, you ever hear of mm -hmm. Leeway? Who? No, no, never. See, we were never, it, like, we were like a cult following band. We were like Tool. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we were mm -hmm. like the Tool of New York crossover. Like, you were a rabid fan, you either hated Leeway or you loved us. Mm hmm. So, I mean, do you think that was part of it? Maybe it was just that identity because you guys were, sure, playing these hardcore venues and shows with hardcore bands, but you really were like a metal band. You know, do you think that was one of those, like, you know, especially back then when it was like, yeah, you almost kind of, you know, I'm going to say forced to choose, but a lot of fans felt like that, right? You had to either be a metalhead or you were a skinhead or a hardcore kid. You know, like, you was, you, to be both and like both, you almost sort of had to, like, you know, not say anything maybe sometimes, especially if you were a punk kid. You, you didn't. You know, punk people just didn't like metalheads. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it was as much the, way, the other way around, but punk hated long haired metalheads. I mean, yeah, that, 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 punks, yeah. It, 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 there yeah. was a lot of problems at the shows because of this, and it, it was mm -hmm. it was just ridiculous. I mean, I, I I found it to be ridiculous, and I was like, listen, you know, this scene is ridiculous. There should, there's no re there should be no reason for violence whatsoever mm -hmm. out there in the shows, and, and and we had to deal with a lot of it, like you know, skinheads coming to our shows or. And, and and the longheads that were coming, a lot of longheads didn't want to come to to to, to crossover band shows. They didn't want to deal with the skinheads. Mm -hmm. The skinheads went there just to, to you know, and many times just to start trouble, the real sure. troubles from skinheads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I, did, I remember be, being caught up in skinhead fights myself, and like like they did, mm -hmm. I, like off the stage, I looked like any other metalhead. They didn't know who I was, mm -hmm. and not yeah. that I. Uh, you know, not that you, know, you you don't know who I am. It's not nothing like that. But it's like, man, dude, there's no reason for this. You you all come to a, you you pay to go to a show just to beat some people down. Mm -hmm. it makes no sense. Yeah, no, I know, I know. It was when, it was when I'll dangerous. tell you, Matt, when the when, when it got gangstish, when the gangs, when the when the thug hardcore came in, that's mm -hmm. what destroyed everything, man. Mm, yeah, I I I, I, I ran a, a you know a, a little label here too, you know, in LA and stuff, and that got in, involved in that too, and that destroyed a lot of things. So, absolutely, I, I agree with that, and we'll definitely talk a little bit about it later. I just I also want to get on to let's talk about I know thirty five years this January is going to mark you know thirty five years since the release of Born to Expire, um, and of course both records you know Desperate Measures as well were both recorded at the notorious Normandy Sound in Warren, Rhode Island, with Tom Soros at the helm there. You know, just the guitar tone on, on especially, well, you know, obviously to start with Born to Expire, and of course that followed over to, to Desperate Measures, the guitar tone on, on those records, man, it just, you know, it was something that obviously everybody was trying to replicate. You know, every other band was trying to go up there and do the pilgrimage up there. And, and try to replicate that. And I, I was, you know, um, telling, um, you know, Eddie, when I interviewed him a few, a few years ago, you know, um, that, you know, but my opinion, nobody, though, was able to get that. If you listen to all those bands that recorded their records at Normandy, I mean, they're great records. I'm not, not going to, I love all those bands, obviously, you know, Sick of It All and, and, and all them. Um, I mean, even this record was recorded up there, too, Beg to Differ, but nothing to me had that tone that you guys were able to get off you know get out of that you know that studio would i be mean, i don't know to, what was the secret to that was it that soundboard i heard good things about the soundboard or was it you guys you and aj just really just creating such a tone that was just your own that no one no one could could seem to copy even though they tried it was definitely a combo it was a soundboard the neve studio console mm -hmm. or it was something it was um it was either a neve studio or something else but we spent so much time on placement of the amps, twisting, turning, even quarter inch, like like that. 
and mm-hmm. mic placement and stuff like that until we had the perfect tones. Maybe other bands were impatient and they just wanted to. We we spent hours twisting and turning and moving the amps into different corners and places like that. And uh, you know, half an inch, a uh, uh, quarter inch, a full inch. You know, you know, moving the mic from one speaker to the next speaker and stuff like that. That's what really gets you a great guitar sound. And the acoustics of the place were great as well. Mm-hmm. So that combination is what gave us our sound. I mean. I agree with you. I, I, I listen to all of the hardcore bands that went up there after us, and I, and I don't find their record sounding as good as Born to Expire or Desert Measures. Mm-hmm. I just don't see it, but may, maybe it's the songwriting, different type of songwriting, or I, I don't know, you know. Yeah, well, I think it just goes to show, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily just, uh, you know, a piece of equipment or a producer or whatever that's going to get a specific sound you want. There's a lot that goes into it. You can't just go up to some place and replicate it. I think that's just what, you know, pretty much what those records proved is, you know, you, you can't, you can't replicate it. And you guys just, you know, really created just such an amazing tone on those records. That just really is, is one of the best tones I've ever heard in terms of, you know, guitar wise. I mean, it's just, it stands out. It's just so thick and, you know, crunchy and just, you know, just unbelievable riffs. You know what I mean? With those tones. Thank you. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, if we had a, and, and to compound that, if we would have had a record label, that would have had that would have treated us properly and distributed the record and if you could find it in the stores it would have sold a lot more you know because yeah. they were great sounding records absolutely I, I totally agree well let's get to the documentary man the forgotten ones um i mean so you know I, like i said i talked about you know you guys just being more of an underappreciated i in my opinion or unnoticed like you said band because of all the the management and record label issues and obviously you know that's that's been out there. We you know, but we'll get into it a little bit later, but definitely, obviously, uh, that was a big factor in terms of why the band was would ne- didn't get to the you know the level of success that you guys, in, you know, in my opinion, a lot of other people's opinions, including yourselves, uh, would agree to that. Um, but you know, the first thing I noticed now with the documentary is you know the live footage, man. There's some great live footage that you got in this film um of the band from from the early days what i mean was this film that stuff that you had were some fans give this to you where where did you get all this 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 film because it's it's really cool man i mean seeing you know, yeah in all honesty youtube the the you know okay. the editor and i source youtube and everything's on youtube everything nice okay i mean i was like wow i remember that concert that was cool i remember that show i remember that show i mean nice people people have uploaded stuff from california from from Rhode Island from Germany in 91 and in 89 and it was, it was like wow holy crap from Europe there's some clips of Europe 89 91 uh I was just like wow holy crap we get everything I need is right here yeah no no doubt so I mean talk about a little bit Mike about you know the, the, I guess the impetus here for putting this you know documentary together I mean um obviously you 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 know this is your this you spearheaded by you um talk about what you really what your your goal was for this documentary what you really wanted to show the fans and just show the public in general about the band and especially those two records obviously i wanted to show the public in general whether retired from this lifestyle or you're still active in it like you still listen to heavy metal or you were once a heavy metal hardcore guy and you have a family now and eight kids or whatever and that and and of course newer fans i just wanted to to let everybody know that there was once a band called Leeway that really was at mm-hmm. the forefront and a lot of, and influenced a lot of other bands. And we never, ever, ever got the recognition we deserved or, or, or we never reached the, the, the point that the band could have been a lot more successful than we were, you know, mm-hmm. I, that, that's what I wanted to do. And I, I wanted to use it as a cautionary tale to newer bands, you know, you know, like now it's harder than ever to, to become successful in this business with streaming, no more record companies, no more a mm. and you know, no more signing, signing bonuses, no more, you know, no more, no more, you know, no more major distribution ever. I'm sure. I mean, you have Spotify and you have Pandora and you could Apple music, but bands aren't seeing much money from, from streaming, you know, from streaming. I, from downloading fans downloading i what like what it what i heard drake had 20 million to 50 million downloads and he sold 153 dollars or something like that like that's that's, mm. that's like oh my god man yeah i know man. It's, 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 i wanted to use it as i, I had a, a different section to be used as a cautionary tale to newer guys to newer bands okay and uh it, it was edited out simply because you 
um, I was told by the editor, look, uh, Amazon Prime will pick it up if it's shorter. They'll pick it up if it's a, if it's a shorter documentary. The shorter, the better. Oh, okay. Like the Billy Joel song, like the entertainer. It was, <laughs> if you want to make a big hit, so I cut it down to three or five. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like you know. Okay. It, it's just um, the way it is. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you know uh, that us big time Leeway fans, you know, really didn't know much about that we found out in the film was obviously. Um, was your exit from the band after Desperate Measures um, that you talk about in the documentary? Um, and when I heard, when first heard you talking about it, you know, it 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 was like, okay, it, you know, a lot of bands that was happened to, unfortunately, a lot of guitarists like yourself who were, for one, you know, metal oriented and played a lot of leads, right? Because in the '90s, no one wanted metal and no one wanted leads, right? It was just no one was into it, right? right? Um, things were slowing down. Obviously, grunge it was was totally the the thing that was the trend. And obviously that that would yeah if, if a band's looking to make a change or do something different that unfortunately guys like yourself were the guys that were now going to have the you know the target on them you know because of that no matter how i think talented you know obviously that you are i don't think there's any question about that <laughs> but it's just that musical trends obviously that was going on and a lot of bands follow that just to stay relevant and so forth you know um now the thing was uh, you weren't replaced, you know, in the band. Obviously, like you said, you you get into it a little. Bit. I don't know. Like I said, I don't want to divulge too much because I do want people to to you know obviously watch the documentary for themselves. But obviously, that you know, you mentioned you basically mentioned the movie that it was one of those you either quit or get fired type of things, right? Pretty much. I mean, when we mm -hmm. when the band, um, I mean, I I I think. This is my take on it. I think like it, it, AJ got so discouraged by what he saw going on. Like when we were in Europe in '91, uh, these guys, Pokey, AJ, and and Jimmy, all they were doing was listening to Temple of the Dog, Soundgarden, uh, Nirvana, Nevermind, uh, Pearl Jam, and stuff like that. And Eddie would be listening to his his music, his hip hop, or whatever he was listening to. And I, you know, I of course I had my Walkman on with my Megadeth and Testament and stuff like that and mm. the stuff that and I uh, when we got back I mean I noticed uh, you know AJ was sort of marginalizing me he wasn't accepting any of my riffs or he was you know we got to do less leads and I had no problem with that I'm not I'm not trying to be uh in here and, sh and uh, the, the show guitar the showman guitar player um let, we're gonna do less leads and this and that and you know and he's telling me well I riff remember that yeah I know you introduced a riff a while back it's kind of old now and you know. I just kept being told, you know, you know, like uh, I just kept being marginalized and pushed mm. out. It, 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 nobody actually fired me, but it was like, you know, you know, when I spoke to the manager, uh, they were like, yeah, well, you know, they, they, they pretty much want to go on with one guitar. Now they, they wanted to follow suit like the Seattle thing. Everybody had mm. one guitar in the band. And that's mm. that's what happened. I think they, they I think they took the after the Seattle criteria. Mm -hmm. I mean, when when the material for Adult Crash was being written, I, I in all honesty, I was saying, I was saying, what the what? Even our sound man said said to me, "Mike, do you like any of the new material AJ's got put coming up with?" And I said, "No." He goes, "What about that new song you wrote that sounds like Soundgarden?" I said, "I said exactly why. I, I this is just ridiculous. It's it's we're returning this band into a Seattle grunge band." Mm -hmm. I remember saying, "AJ, listen, we should go back to Born to Expire. Let's go back to our roots." And let's mm. start over again. And Profile Records had just dropped us, thankfully. We were begging to be dropped. And finally, one of the uh, junior A&R people said, this is what you got to do to make this band successful. And they were like, nah, let's just drop them. Because <clears throat> we were all being used as tax write-offs. Us, Murphy's Law, cro Wargasm. So what, what happened was, uh, it, it, by that point, I was I was like, all right, listen, I'll, I'll bow and I'm done. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not happy here. Mm. I'm just not into it. But before all of that, the band did break up. AJ actually broke the band up. He oh, left okay. because there was both the original both worlds, if you remember. Mm -hmm. I remember that. It was yeah. supposed to be AJ, Zowie, John Joseph, Mackie mm -hmm. on drums. Mm -hmm. And um, oh God, I forgot who the other guitarist was. Maybe, maybe Todd. I'm not sure. Todd Youth, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But um Steve Aprey, the head DJ WSRU, he he, uh, he was like, "Listen, I'll, I can get you guys uh, gigs, forty miles and chains when they come to the city, and this and that." So AJ, AJ, AJ actually said the worst to me. I'm splitting, bro. I'm out of here. 
whatever, both worlds didn't work out in their spare time. And, you know, they reformed Lee Wei and they just reformed without me. So I was like, yeah, you know, better, more power to you guys, man. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think if you guys would have, you know, like as you suggested, going back to a born to expire sound at the time, do you think that could have, you know, because like you were just saying before, right? At that time, one of the things too is you started getting all the, the 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 beat down hardcore. That's what hardcore started turning into in the nineties, right? With Biohazard and the Gnostic Fronts, One Voice. It was more of a beat down sort of. Like you said, a lot of the urban really right. sound and influence in there. Um, but I mean, and going back to a Born to Expire, you know, as, as big as it was, again, music trending wise, maybe not. I mean, do you think that could have? I wouldn't say salvaged a band, but you, you, I mean, that was obviously your idea. Now, was everyone else uh, on board with doing the grunge thing? Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, they were. They, wanted, they, okay. they just wanted to go forward with the newer sound, the newer grunge sound. Mm. Uh, not, not, uh, uh, they wanted to keep it individual and original, like as far as Leeway, they wanted to have their own impression, mm. their own sound, but, it, it, you know, they would definitely follow in a, in, in a grunge songwriting criteria. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, the, the beat down hardcore is, you know, when it came in, like, um, I remember Diana Darwin, she was a local journalist up here. She was, uh, Mike Gitter, the a &R man from, uh, mm -hmm. Wea, mm -hmm. his girlfriend. She actually, in an article, she, she said, you know, she was just doing an article on how things were changing. And she said, things are getting, uh, going for the worst, this and that, this band, that band, and, and notorious Brooklyn thugs biohazard. Mm. And I'm sitting there like, whoa, that, that's not a nice thing to say. I mean, I knew the guys in BioArts. They're super guys. They're great mm -hmm. guys, man. Mm -hmm. I, and I was like, whoa, you know, wow. They're not thugs. They're not, they're not robbing banks here. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, his sister. But, like, you know, that discourages yeah. a lot of people. Uh, you know, you know, the tough guy stuff. In, in mm -hmm. Brooklyn, you best watch your back. And, like, mm -hmm. you know, five blocks of the subway, I can make it, you know. Sure, New York was crime ridden. I don't. I don't even know if that's what the song is about. To be honest with you, mm. but um, you know, Derek, I, I don't mean to. I, I'm. I'm not calling anybody out here, and I'm not trying to start any nonsense. Or, but bands like you know, Mad Bull and and Marauder and the, the whole the you know, the whole gangster hardcore to me is what started bringing it down. It started making it like, oh man. I remember uh, Marauder did a few shows with us, and uh, I'm not I'm not even going to name the name. One of the guys uh, had a 22 in his bag with his equipment. Mm. A 27. I'm like, dude, this is this is this is entertainment. This is music. What are you doing with that firearm here? Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And, and yeah. I'll be honest with you, it's suicidal as well. When I when you see them with their blue bandanas with covering half their eyes, I, every time I looked at Mike Muir, I was like, uh, gangster. You know, he's gangster. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was you know it was just, it was just the '90s, right? It was yeah. I mean, because rap is so huge, and especially in New York, I mean, that's where it was, you know came but from. Everybody, right? you know, yeah. kids mm -hmm. bought into it. Kids liked you know every kid mm -hmm. wants to be tougher than they are. They want to be like you know, don't yeah. f with me. I'll I got my boys. I'll bust you up, and mm -hmm. that that exploded, and it got these bands really big. Yeah, no, it did, man. I mean, and and it carried on to. Yeah, other countries and so forth, where people were emulating those that kind of not just yeah, I mean, style, look, I mean, the attitude, look, yeah. I, I remember when DMS were were the cult, were called Doc Martin skinheads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they and 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 look at them now, they're a worldwide, uh, uh, yep. you know, uh, um, organization. They're like yep. Hell's Angels, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and I remember when when they started, they were more like you know, I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they mm -hmm. were more like fighters at the shows. They were definitely you know. Oh yeah. They, they were fighters. You know, they they definitely. I remember that. Mm -hmm. They got it. They started a lot of stuff at shows. They, they were fighters. I mean, the infamous riot show at the Palladium with the Agnostic Front when the bouncers didn't know how to handle a hardcore crowd because they, they never saw this kind of moshing and stuff. And the guys from DMS had enough of it. And they were like, mm -hmm. fuck these motherfuckers. And they started attacking the bouncers. And everybody did. The crowd followed them. Yeah. But then, I, I was it's like, crazy. man, this, this is not what I signed on for. I wanted this to be a little better. You want to have a fight? You go to a bar, you step outside. Mm -hmm. that's the way it should you know that's the old school i know that's the way we we grew up i know right it's, i mean uh, yeah. and, and, and today but like you know i i was always like man this is what's killing this this uh you know you know this, that's what's killing this scene <laughs>
Let's talk about something that people do know about the band, as we alluded to before we talked a little bit about, with the history with Profile Records, Chris Williams in a rock hotel. I mean, another just another music business blunder. You know, we, we've seen so many of them over the years. And like I said, it was it was obviously you guys. It was, it was Murphy's Law, Crow Mags, and War Guys. I mean, you guys were the four bands signed to Profile, which was a, a rap label at the time, right? It was, it was Run DMC's label. Um, and... Um, Obviously, you know, it just it, it's, it's typical music business, right? I love the music business, but at the same time, it's the worst thing in the world, right? I mean, it's it just sucks that you've got, you know, I mean, music and money are like oil and water, art and money, just in general, or, or like oil and water, you know. I mean, yeah. just the elements are just polar opposites, and so you know, it's just it's always hard to make those two kind of you know come together and coalesce and and work. Um, it's just a fucked up thing. You know, yeah, yeah, I remember, you know, in, in New York that time you had, uh, was it Maze Records that did something similar to Biohazard and Sheer Terror with a similar sort of situation. Delayed records already done in, in the can, ready to go. Takes a year, year and a half to two years to come out. Um, you know, uh, but there's there's been bands over the years that, you know, I mean, you've, you've had Shadows Fall cover you guys. I know you did Mark and Squealer some years ago. I know some, some big, you know, um, a lot of course, like a band like Power Trip, you know, they they talk about all the time what, what a huge influence uh, leeway was on them, right, especially right. Desperate Measures. They love. So, well, I mean, I, what's your? I I mean, do you take? I mean, as as much as obviously you guys got screwed over, um, and you know, there's obviously you know, I mean, Chris Williams is obviously always going to be you know just a, a total scumbag because of what he did. I mean, is there anything where you could sit there and and, and say well at least we got something out of it or is it one of those where because you did i think i remember i don't know if it was i think you what you told us i mean right i think it was in effect i believe howie abrams wanted to sign you guys as well because i think we talked about yeah, that sure. when we had you guys started. on and roadrunner was interested i think in you guys was well was that, uh, was yeah, that the, roadrunner right? were very interested but we already signed the profile and recorded the record and i was like oh my god mm -hmm. jesus h christ we're signed to pro we're signed to profile and now roadrunner approaches is great Oh, so that was after. Okay, that was after you guys. Yeah, it was like a, it was okay. like. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the night. It was January twenty second, eighty eight, when I spoke to one of the A and R guys. Mm -hmm. We were supporting Exodus at the Ritz, MOD and Exodus, and the Roadrunner record uh, 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 employee approached me. I can't remember his name. I don't think it was Psycho Abrams. I, I, I don't. I don't think it was uh, Psycho. I, I can't remember who it was. And I was like, well, uh, the record was recorded already. We recorded in November. He was like, oh, shit. Man, I didn't even know that. Mm. I was like, oh, this is fabulous. We wanted the record out by February of 88 because we recorded it in November of 87. And, of mm. course, you know, we were, it got delayed a year because Chris was shopping and looking for a deal and looking for the best financial deal for himself. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned two things. Um Oil and water, you know, like like mm -hmm. how, how uh, like art and money, like oil and water, is, and the music business. I wish I had the foresight to see that when I was younger. <laughs> I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Matt, I'm I'm just gonna be honest with the audience and the planet, the world, the Leeway fans. Am I bitter? Mm -hmm. Fucking a. Mm -hmm. I'm very okay. bitter mm -hmm. at what happened at, at the at the at the success of other bands compared to us. I mean, I'm happy for guys like Bioaz who are, who are friends of mine. You know, mm -hmm. the reunion tour is going great. They're, they're playing in monster crowds. That's great because they're friends of mine. And, and, and they hustled. They worked. Biohazard did work mm -hmm. to get to what they what, what they were, but, like, to get to where they are. Uh, but, but um, like, for instance, we never had those opportunities because guys like Chris Williamson held us down. He mismanaged us. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Biohazard signed to Roadrunner Records, uh, they, they, they had Rush Artist Manager, Scott Coney, taking really good care yeah. of them. Mm. Um, you know, they got signed to Roadrunner to a one record deal, which was unheard of. Roadrunner heard of, signed, yeah. signed you to eight album deals and stuff like yep. that. And then they, they bumped up to Warner Brothers, and that was great. I was like, man, this is you know, this is awesome. And I mean, but after Profile Records and after Chris Williams and we after we split from him, no one approached us. No one. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. And I was like, man, we were we just we were, we were free and clear of profile. Nobody has to buy us. It's not like how he has to buy us anymore, because mm -hmm. um, Chris was asking way too much of an advance for Cromag's Leeway Murphy's Law, mm -hmm. and then uh, Howie was like, "Well, what about just Leeway? I'll take just Leeway." And Chris was still asking for too much money because mm -hmm. he wanted Freddie Alva just did uh, from a uh, um, Freddie Alva wrote for uh, uh, just 
did a review for us for No Echo for Carlos Ramirez's uh, mag. Okay. Yeah. Freddie Alba's a local journalist up here. He's been writing hardcore books and, and doing reviews for 35 years. Mm-hmm. He, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it's on the internet. He, he worded it perfectly about Chris Williams. He worded it perfectly. I just can't think of what he used about how this guy's personal greed stepped in front of every band he was supposed to be representing. And it's so mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. uh, he really did not do us any favors. And I'm, I'm saying, I mean, everybody's passing us by. Everybody's going from st- nicer ru- studios Leeway is digressing. We're going from good studios in Manhattan to rehearsing on Wooster Street, like to, mm-hmm. to going back to the Queens Music Building. I'm like, what the heck? Did, we're supposed to be going this yeah. way, fellas, yeah. not this way. We're mm-hmm. digressing. Mm-hmm. This is horrible. Don't you see what's going on here? Mm-hmm. And and uh, I remember we, we there was a gig booked at the Right Track Inn. Now all 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 due respect to the right track in and the bands that played there, you know, that, that that's, it's a starting point. The right track in February of Long Island on Henson Turnpike. That's where you started these clubs. And, and we're, we're playing the right track in one night. And I'm saying, I, I, is this, a, is it, AJ, is this a fucking joke? You booked this at the right track in. And, and he's like, Oh, we haven't played Long Island in a while. I'm like, yeah. How about Sundance? How about places? Oh, right. We can't fill Sundance because nobody bought our records because our record company, the record contract you signed, it didn't put our records in stores. Mm-hmm. But then again, you know, I, I was just bitter because, but uh, you know, AJ couldn't help but sign it because nobody, nobody was getting signed at the time. Pro, mm-hmm. Profile was the only record company that made the move to sign crossover bands. And then right after Profile Records, there's a boom, everybody else starts signing underground bands. Mm. But yeah, um, yeah. I was just like, you know, we're playing the right track in. This is ridiculous. We, we and our, our management at the time was um one of the roadies from Bad Brains. He started managing us, mm-hmm. and it, it was like being managed by a, a rapper. He he was a rapper guy guy. It, it was like being excuse me. It was, it was like being managed by a fucking gangster, mm-hmm. like a thug gangster, street gangster, not like a mafia. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like, man, this this is not good. Everything's going backwards. We're not we're not advancing. We're not we're not dealing with professional people. Like we, we get we, we, and the right track in the right track in gig was so funny. Like ten people showed up oh, because geez. people couldn't believe that leeway, the leeway was playing at the, right, the right track in a mm. club where you start, where cover bands play, where where fifteen year olds play, where you mm. start, and and people couldn't believe it. People were like, because the guy said the one the promoter was like, I was getting hundreds of phone calls all week. Are you sure it's? Leeway, the D Leeway is playing at <laughs> oh, the right track in. Oh, and uh, one kid bought a desert measure shirt and then he returned it right away. I don't want this shirt anymore. And he says to me, Who, how do I get my money back? I said, like, Talk to that guy right there. Oh my god, manager. Wow. I was like, yeah. Talk to him right there. Oh man, yeah, it's just you know, obviously, you just it, it uh, like I said, you mean for the band, man, I mean. Uh, yeah, you've got a cult following, but yes, it's got to suck, you know, just hearing these stories, you know, I, obviously it, it's, I hate hearing these stories because there is so many, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad people in that. I mean, just there's bad people in business in general, let alone. Right. I mean, business, some people know? really helped their bands, like Sick of It All went to East West, Atco, Major Label. Yep. Yeah. I mean, um, Prong, Epic, Support, mm-hmm. Ozzy, Jesus Christ, man. I, I was saying to myself, imagine being on the road with Ozzy. Oh my God! I knew all the Randy Road solos back then. I was like, "Chill, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll play." <laughs> give Zach a give Zach a break. Yeah. Oh man. Well, yeah. Well, so right, so let's get back into the doc, Mike. You know, um, like I said, it's 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 a really good watch. Any Leeway fans gonna love this? So even even uh, people that don't know much about the band really need to check it out and just really get a good grasp on what the band was about. I mean, just seeing you know, those, like I said, live footage is just great. Now, the other thing, I'm I'm you know obviously. Hearing from people, you say whether it's it's reviews or, or just people in general out of fans of the band. Obviously, the first thing they noticed when they watched the film is okay. You know, there's you know Eddie's in there. He's, he's with with Drew Stone uh, interview he did with him sometime you know recently. But obviously, no AJ. Now I'm now just just for the record stuff, right? Were, were these guys all approached to be part of the of the documentary when you when you started doing it? Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I I spoke to Eddie and. Uh... Uh, uh, Eddie was going through his cancer treatments and everything, yeah. and so he was like, "No, I'm, you know, I'm pretty good. I can, you know, you just, you know, do what's right." And, mm-hmm. and I included clips of Eddie, like uh, being yeah. interviewed by, by other people and Drew Stone and 
And um, AJ said, no, I, I'm not interested. I don't want to appear in any interviews. I don't want to do any uh, documentary, nothing. Mm-hmm. AJ, I think AJ's just about had it with everything. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But AJ doesn't do interviews anymore. He's not interested no, in doing any press or nothing. I would just think, listen, just as a fan, I, I mean, I know that there's a lot of people that do love the band. And there's a lot of people who are just discovering a band. And if, if you guys had ever, you know, either you know, were able to like re release the records or just do a reunion show, I mean, you guys obviously did the tour back in, in the mid 2000s to Europe. I mean, it's just, it's sad because I think there is some stuff there on the table for you guys now, you know, now better late than never. But it seems like you're kind of, I mean, obviously, you said Eddie obviously is, you know, fighting super hard through his cancer. He's, he's alive and kicking and he's, he's kicking ass with it. And, I'm sure he would do that in a heartbeat. He's still going out there playing shows. With yeah, no, anyway, yeah, sure. yeah, but it's, it's a really surprising me. The other guys really aren't interested, especially AJ, because this is his baby. I mean, why do you think he just wants nothing to do with it? You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, do you think, let's put it this way. Do you think he fears th- that, you know, that he doesn't want leeway turning into a cro situation? Let me just put it that way. I mean, do you guys have, let's put it this way. I mean, is there such, I guess, maybe friction with, with certain members that you guys couldn't get back together or couldn't do something like that? I mean, just Absolutely. talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, like, the other three guys, Jimmy, Pokey, and I, I don't know what happened from, I was gone in 92. From 92 to 2006, I don't know what happened. I, I mm. did something that there was always infighting. There was always disagreements all the time. To you know, four different personalities. You can have band disagreements, whatever. We did the reunion tour in 2006. It was fun. It was we played a lot of festival shows. It was a lot of fun and stuff mm. like that. We come back. Something I don't know what went on, but something went on between 2006. I really have no idea. I'm not privy to it. I don't care. I don't want to. No, I, I just don't care. Mm. 2006 till now, I don't know. AJ, Pokey, and Jimmy do not want anything to do with Eddie, and Eddie doesn't want anything to do with them. Mm. Like okay. they, they just don't want to work together anymore. You know, Eddie, Eddie said, "I'm quite happy doing the leeway in New York City. I was a part of the band. I was a frontman. I wrote all the lyrics. I have every right to go out and play live." Mm-hmm. I said, "Yeah, you're not getting any beat for me." As a matter of fact, I filled, I filled, I, I filled in for two shows at Leeway New York City because Eddie, one of the guitar players. Uh, couldn't make two gigs or something like that. So I, I, I stepped up there and went up there and played the nice. shows mm-hmm. just, you know, out of courtesy to Eddie, you know, I, sure. I but AJ and um, AJ Poodle, Poodle, Jimmy, Jimmy Zantos, AJ and, mm-hmm. and Pokey, you know, they, speaking of the documentary, I couldn't even get in touch with Pokey. I couldn't even get in touch with him. I texted him two, two times, three times. He never got back to me. So I, Figured he'd be all right with it. Nobody, I'm not bashing anybody in the documentary. I don't say anything bad about the guys, but mm-hmm. it was, it, there was definitely some sort of inner something went on where, I mean, where, where they just don't want to deal with Eddie anymore and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And uh, you brought up the Chromex situation. Like, you know, this is, I uh, like, you know, the, you know, the way Paris is Paris just like, you know, I, I asked Paris and Harley to appear in the documentary Mm-hmm. You know, being, being we were label mates to profile and they were like, you know, they, they came out before us and they were sort of like, you know, they guided us. They nurtured us for a little while at Crow Mags. And, uh, you know, Paris pretty much straight up said, oh, I, I I regret the day I ever lifted a finger to help those guys. Something went on between Paris and AJ with, with uh, he, he, you know, because Paris commented to me that fuck's been making money playing my off my off playing my songs live for 20 years now with nothing to do with them. And uh, you know, mm. with the J, with the Chromex JM, John Mackin and yeah. Carly, and I, I, you know, I don't know what went on there, but but you know, but, you know, Paris and Harley have zero love for Leeway, and there was plenty of Chromex infighting going on as well between you know those guys. It, it, what sucks about it is just that you know this is such a great time where um, they could you know put a, a nice, I guess, ending to the the legacy of these bands, especially Leeway, yeah. Um, and yeah, good. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll see what the future holds. We, you, mm. you, know, you can never say never. Um, yeah. Like you mm-hmm. mentioned that this is the 35th year Born to Expire has mm-hmm. been on the planet. It's It could have been the 36th year if Chris would have let the album just come out on profile. Mm. And same thing happened with Desperate Measures. It was delayed a year. We recorded in April of 90. It didn't come out till June of 91. But that's when the buzz of the band dies down and it's mm. over. You know, it's like, but anyway, we're, we're trying to get the original rights back from Sony Music. 
Sony okay. Music owns Leeway, Born to Expire, and Desert Measures. Okay. So we have a lawyer working with us, and uh, this is, you know, we paid him his uh, his. Um, it was a small fee just to get him to to get this happen. If, if they release the tapes, the master tapes, and uh, the publishing to AJ, then we can shop for another deal. Maybe you know if okay. somebody wants to do this right and put this record out the right way and do it, you know, properly. Yeah, I mean, especially with you know, with just the, the, the you know resurgence of vinyl. I mean, I, I I don't know what you know fan of the band wouldn't go ahead. I mean, I'm a vinyl collector, but I know plenty of others too. It's like I mean, to have those records on vinyl, you know remastered or whatever you want to do you know whatever just repackaged would be just you know obviously a, a great you know not just like i said it'd be great for everybody you know what i mean fans for you guys i mean everybody just like just to really put a good i guess you know stamp air ending on on the band you know what i mean i think you did a great job in the documentary you know capturing like i said really the essence of the band you know what i mean you, you did a great job with that and and like i said for people who Obviously, you know the band; they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, love it. And people who don't know the band that well and just trying to get into them, it really, it really gives a good backstory, you know, to to what it was all about, especially just the making of those two records and obviously all the shit you guys had to go through and why you guys obviously didn't, you know, uh, become more successful, you know, because of all the, you know, the stuff, all the stuff that was out of your hands that you, you know, that yeah, was, it was, was your fault. I mean, yeah. it was terrible, terrible, like. No promotion. I mean, when you speak of a, a, a profile being a hip hop label, we um we were we were in the profile records offices one day. I was waiting downstairs. Eddie was upstairs. I, I drove him in for something. I forgot. Mm -hmm. But Eddie and AJ went upstairs, and I'm waiting in my car down below on Broadway in Manhattan. And uh, Run DMC were up there, and Run Run was talking to Eddie on the side, saying, "Listen, they the most successful band profile records ever had that sold millions of records for profile was still trying to get off the label because profile was stiffing them with money. Wow, yeah. Run, Run DMC at that time was only making money from their Coca Cola endorsement. Mm, interesting. I mean, he, I mean right. well, yeah. you know, th these guys, well, uh, uh, Scott Plotnicki and and uh, Corey, I forgot whatever his last name is, some, some other guy, Corey something, the, the CEO. Mm. I mean, these guys, they, they really ruined careers. And this guy wouldn't stop. Uh, this guy, he, he's like a 75 year old grandfather. And he said, uh, I'll, I'll make right with Harley Flanagan if he offers me a publish, uh, a public apology. And I'm like, this guy's 75 years old, worth millions of wow. dollars. What do you care about Harley Flanagan in your yeah. life? You want a public <laughs> apology from Harley Flanagan and then you'll stop. Then you'll stop re releasing hit the record. Like it's mm -hmm. weird because Harley didn't want profile to he Harley sent sent out a sent out a statement a few months back. Nobody buy this record from profile. Don't buy mm -hmm. the new uh, Age of Coral re release. Don't do it. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. Guy, you're a 75 year old grown man. And you want a public apology? Like, yeah, it's that's kind of pathetic. Dude? Yeah, there's something wrong. Well, I mean, I think listen, I think there's something wrong with you in general when you're sitting there profiting you know i mean i think what they did obviously a lot, a lot of labels did this especially with you know they did it with hip-hop anything that was urban based you know they knew you know the, a lot of these kids were you know were you know musicians whatever weren't you know from the, the let's put it this way they were you know they were from they came up grew up through tough times yeah sure lot, especially them. like the hip-hop guys exactly and so it was easy to oh they got some talent we could fucking totally fuck these guys over and and basically make you know a fortune off their music you know what i mean we just you know, I mean, and it's that happened so much and it is. It's like, you know, I mean, it's obviously, you know, I mean, I don't want to get too deep into it. But the bottom line is, yeah, I mean, it's an unfortunate thing, obviously, um, yeah, that you guys just didn't, you know, get anything. I, I think what sucked for, for Leeway more than anything wasn't even so. I mean, obviously, you guys made no money off anything, but you, you didn't even get, you know, uh, the notoriety or you said th that you deserved. You didn't get the record out there. You didn't get the tour support to go out there and really, you know, uh, pu push, you know, just push the band and, and keep it going. I mean, you kept getting, you know, fucked over from all these, you know, these long delays. I mean, like you said, I mean, both records were, were just took forever to come out, you know, just, yeah, just a, a very unfortunate thing. But the good thing is, is this documentary, I think really just puts a good, a, a positive spin on it. you obviously address all of that, but you also talk about the good things, the celebratory things. Of leeway too you know i mean and, and the thing is like we, we, it's easy to get mired in all the negativity and all the shit that happened to you guys but when you think about all the positive all the great music you put out and and like i said there are so many prominent musicians out there that know of and really you know love the band 
And, you know, yes, maybe not some of you are just generic fans, you know, maybe don't know the band, but all the real prominent musicians and fans out there, they know who Lee Wei is. They know what a great band you guys were. And I think that, you know, this documentary really does uh, justice to it. Now, just in terms of back to the documentary, um, obviously people could go ahead and they could buy it on Amazon Prime, right? That's where it's available right now, Mike. Right. Correct. Okay. I mean, it will be available on other stream, uh, search engines and on other streaming services like Tubi and Freebie, but it takes a little longer for them to pick it up. Amazon mm-hmm. Prime usually usually gets it quick. Quickest. Okay. Yeah. Now, so how long? I mean, I remember you know, like I said, we talked back you know some years ago. You, you, I know you you wanted to do this and you're working on this. Um, how, I mean, putting this together. Was it, I mean, this is obviously the first time you've done something like this, you know yeah. what I mean? So t- talk a little bit about just the process of it. I mean, how difficult was it? Was it, you know, I mean, it, it, like I said, it's it's not easy, obviously, doing something like this, uh, getting all the footage and, and just talking to people and so forth. I mean, did this come kind of smoothly or was this kind of a difficult process for you to, to go through all this? It wasn't that difficult, thankfully, because I had such an excellent editor, Mike Belmont from, um, LA Productions. He works mm. on Blue Bloods. He and uh, he's a local guy from Queens. He lives in Ozone Park. And thanks, Mike. Nice. If you see this uh, podcast, I'll, I'll definitely send you the link. Mm. Thank you for all your hard work and everything. He made it so smooth. This editor, he just made it everything. He's the one that got it on Amazon for me. He made every. He submitted it to all the two uh, film hub that submits it to everybody else. Um, he he made it happen. I, I I never did this in my life. And even Drew Stone commented in a private message to me. He wrote, "Amazing." I nice. said, he, "He goes, who directed it?" I said, "Drew, I don't know. Mm. I, there is no director." I put up my iPhone and my Olympus camera, digital uh, camera, in two different spots, and I just started talking. Yeah. That's why it's so hard to hear me. And I'm sorry in advance, everybody. I had the radio playing, but I was just I was just talking about what went on and like mm. speaking of like, you know, horrible management, like, like we never even got our manager at the time. He never even got uh, like, he was never evil able to get us endorsements, like musical instrument endorsements mm. and stuff like that. And like, he, yeah. everybody's getting endorsements and moving on and going far farther. And I'm sitting there like, AJ, what the hell is going on here, man? Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing you mentioned too, you know, in the documentary about yourself, it's that you were the, you're always the guy getting in trouble, right? Like, you know, out of all the guys in the band, you were the, you were the, you're the guy speaking up. I mean, you're, you're an Irish guy, right? So like, you, yeah. you, know, you got that fight in Irish spirit. You ain't going to let someone run all over you. I, I mean, did, I mean, so that's probably, I think, one of the reasons too why, you know, I mean, it's got to be difficult for you. And, and even maybe this documentary is probably pretty cathartic for you. You know what I mean? Just getting your story out there. I know you've been wanting to really just get, you know, not just that your story, but get the story about the records and all the, 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 the history of it. But really also talking about your, you know, peace within the band too, especially because, you know, like you said, you kind of got sort of pushed out in those early, you know, in the early 90s there. Um, so this must have been pretty cathartic, I would assume, too, for you just so that people, you know, instead of you just going on Facebook and talking like this or talking on a, on a podcast, here it is with, with, a, with a nice, you know, one hour, you know, almost an hour long uh, film for people to watch to really just kind of see or get at least your angle of really what went on back there. I mean, was this pretty cathartic for you doing this? And and do you feel kind of better now? Like, you know, now that it's out there and people are hearing the story, I'm sure you're getting a lot of great feedback, obviously, about it. Um, so it's got, I, I would think it's pretty cathartic. Yes, sir. Or no. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get a lot more feedback, to be honest with you. Because, but, okay. you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, uh, I, I've been getting nothing but great reviews on it, but a lot of, but there's a lot of people that aren't buying it, aren't renting it, aren't, you know, stuff like that. I mean, mm. I just wanted people to know that there was a band that existed. That was an excellent band that I got into back in high school. When I first heard the demo, I was like, wow, if you ever mm. need a guitar player, that's how good the band was. It piqued my interest, you know, mm-hmm. you know, I was, you know, at that time I was listening to Metallica and Exodus and Megadeth and, Boom, I heard this leeway thing. I was like, holy shit, this is excellent. Mm-hmm. And um yeah. I just hope it get, I hope I hope it gets a lot more streams. I mean, I'm I'm working with a publicist right now to try and mm-hmm. promote this as much as possible, but um I'm hoping that this this streams a lot more and people people uh rent it, you know, it's a dollar ninety nine. I you know, yeah, it's nothing it's cheap, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it was just the experiences like when 
um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm good with it, but I, I'm just hoping it becomes, if, if say this thing flops and nothing ever happens and no one cares about it and, and mm. Amazon Prime drops it a week from now, I'll, I'm just going to be like, you see, another leeway thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I think the only reason why people wouldn't, you know, maybe give it a, a fair shot or whatever, just because you, you don't, you know, like I said, maybe AJ's not in it. And you know how it is too with, you know, with the scene, I mean, you've got, you always have these different factions in, in New York, you know, the New York scene. I mean, just, you know, French, like little clicks, right? So you, you might have a click that's, you know, well, AJ's done it. I'm not going to watch it. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. You, you're going to, yeah, that's just going to happen. But I think, um, yeah, but I think, like I said, that's why I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm having you on you. I, I want, I do want people to watch it because it is, it is a good, at the bottom line, if this guy didn't want to be in it, well, that's, I mean, I mean that's that's their decision, right? You you decided to go ahead and do this, and they could have been in it, and, and they decided not to. I'm glad, just as a fan, that that, and I know a lot of fans are that there's something out there now, you know, I mean, where there where there wasn't before. It's funny how you mention that because I I reached out to a few other people, like you know, and that were in prominent bigger bands in the late '80s, early mm -hmm. '90s, and three or four of them were like. Um, Three or four of the members were like, "Oh well, who else is doing this? What's going on? Uh, who who else is uh, uh, doing this? You know, I I don't want to offend anybody." And I'm like, "No, dude, it, this isn't about offending anybody. Just just tell me what you think. Tell me what. Send mm -hmm. me a thirty second clip of how you felt about the band Leeway. I know you liked this. I know you were a fan. Mm -hmm. Or even if you weren't a fan, just send me. I even said uh, said to Harley. I said, just just videotape yourself. It can't all be but." can't all be butterflies and rainbows if, if, yeah. you, if you anybody that disliked leeway i wanted them to contribute too mm -hmm. i thought they were overrated but you know whatever let mm -hmm. them have their thing their day in the sun but there were people that were afraid i mean well-known musicians to this day that were afraid mm -hmm. to like offend other people if they uh, contributed yep. to this film and i'm there like if somebody said to me if you said to me hey, hey you want to make a comment on my band i'd be like sure mm-hmm that it's my opinion. I don't care what you think or how you feel. I, it's my opinion. I'm telling this guy's documentary. Hey, mm -hmm. it, it was so strange. One guy, one guy actually unfriended and blocked me from Facebook because I, wow. kind of, I, I, I uh, damn because I, I I asked him if he would um, contribute, and then he refriended me and stuff. I, I, I was like. All right. Oh dude. man, yeah. It was just weird. It was like weird how people didn't want to get involved. I mean, Tommy uh, even said. Tommy Victor said, "I'm yeah. still, I'm still tight with Pokey. I don't want to rub anyone the wrong way." I'm like, Tommy, you're not rubbing anyone the wrong way. You're just telling mm. me what you think of the band. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's probably like I said. I think people are uh, just don't. They see what they saw what happened with like a band like the Cro-Mags, and I think most people just don't. I'm just assuming that's that's their their thing. Is they're like you know they don't want to get into the middle of if there is is conflicts within a band, they just don't want to get in the middle of it, but. You know, um, look, I'm I'm obviously grateful you asked me to to, to you know uh, do my part, and I'm I'm grateful. Well, I'm, that you, I'm thankful that you did. Thank you, man. Yeah, I'm grateful that you put me in it. But you know, obviously, I'm not a, a, a prominent musician within the scene. Obviously, I'm not Tommy Victor or whatever. Um, but I, I, that, that's just my guess. Is just you know, it, it, once again, it's just you know, people probably saw what happened with some other bands. They know how you know they just maybe like you said, they're afraid to offend anyone, and that's what we see a lot of. I mean, that's a whole other topic for the, the time, but. We just see that a lot, lot in life in general these days because of social media, everything. Everyone's just afraid to offend because people are getting offended left and right, you know, for some reason these days. It's a soft yeah, world right now. Whatever. I don't know. Yeah. It's the way it is. Life. Oh, actually, it's just the way it is. It is. It is. It's unfortunate. But anyway, man. So, Lee Wei, the Forgotten Ones. Uh, so, like we said, it's on Amazon Prime right now. You can go check it out. Real, you know, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a really good background if, uh, on those two records, especially. If you want to know a little more about what's what went on, you know, during those great recording sessions and with all the bullshit, unfortunate bullshit that happened, this is it right here. Uh, Mike, any, where anywhere else we should send uh, people to go check it out? I mean, you said you get you get you you got some publicity coming out soon that's going to help push it. Um, and what about yourself too? And just in general, I mean, what do you got going on? Do you still play? I know you were playing in a cover band. You still do some cover cover stuff here and there well, or no right the band uh, we 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 departed from the band about a year ago we're putting my my old my uh, childhood friend my friend richie and i will put together a new band now okay so we're trying we just, we just need a vocalist and we're good okay but at our age at our age it's very difficult to find a vocalist somebody who's 50 yeah. something that that can sing robert plant or 
Mm -hmm. because it was great playing the boss playing zeppelin and this and that and then and uh judas priest and you know it's very mm -hmm. difficult finding somebody in our age group that can still sing amazingly other than we have this one prodigy in a neighbor named john o'malley and the guy the guy's 57 years of age and he still sings like he could still sing like rob Halford. so like oh, in nice. 1981 nice it's amazing <laughs> yeah, yeah never no, lost no. his voice always kept up on it yeah, no, no doubt, man. I mean, that's yeah. Well, I mean, you like I said, you're you know, everyone knows you, your prowess on the guitar, you know. So I mean, I just hope you still continue to play. Um, I, you know, I yeah, I know it's you're getting older. It ain't uh, yeah, yeah. Well, my 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 liver cirrhosis it really screws up my hands. It, it, oh, puts, it does. Mm. It, it causes what they call clubbing. It's it's like you, my fingers. Uh, you can ask my wife. You can ask anybody. My fingers get stuck like this together. They they they. It's like mm. they just get stuck. Like my, my my joints just stick, and I'm like this, and walking around the house like this. Whoa! Oh shit, man. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, if hey, at least we we still got those great you know Leeway records from you. Like I said, obviously, um, still I guess that I still those things are still both those records are still in my rotation. You know, I listen to them. Beautiful. You know, Thank still. You. I mean, and I know a lot of other people that do as well. Though they just don't get old. You know, those are just two records that just never get and of boring course, old. I just want to send. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, so I go just ahead. Send my condolences to you. I know how tight you were with Bob. I used to love listening to his show early in the in the mm. '80s and mm -hmm. him and the Lester Banks show. What I used to have to do to get reception back in back in Queens, New York, in the '80s, it was incredible. What I mm. would have to do to listen to Bob's show, I'd have to put up a, a coat hanger on my stereo and tie aluminum foil to it and then <laughs> lean it out the window so I could record it. Nice. This is the only place where, where you were hearing Exodus or or the first Metallic album when Bob would play it. And, I, yeah. and I'd be like, wow, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like this for two hours holding on to my record <laughs> with my finger and, and the aluminum foil and the coat hanger like this. Yeah, man. It's, I tried to do it, right? I used <laughs> to, we did when we were younger. Yeah, I remember. I remember, you know, Queens listening to WSAU having to do certain shit like that oh, too. Oh, sure, man, man, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was yeah. I was in the alleyway. Like my 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 basement apartment was. I was on the ground, sort of. I was below this below ground surface, and that's what we had. To, yeah, thankfully, yes, so you came in clear when I tied. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I well, I I just put a, a a coat hanger on on the stereo in the house, and it came in. Thankfully, it came in nice. Yeah, I mean, it was even. I remember even in, uh, when I got my first apartment in Brooklyn. I remember it was the same. I was so happy because I didn't have to do that shit anymore because it was closer. <laughs> it was closer. I'm like, all right, nice. I don't have to do that anymore. But uh, yeah, but no, Mike. You know, like I said, great uh, documentary, man. And yeah, and Bob, of course, would pre really appreciate that you put him in there as well, man. Uh, cause he was a fan of the band as well. And, you know, and that was the thing too. He always talked about leeway was, you know, on the West coast, you know, too, is, is interesting because, you know, he, he had a bunch of buddies that kept, you know, saying the name leeway. I think it was because when you guys toured with the bad brains, it definitely made, you know, out there, it definitely made an impression on a lot of the fans. And, um, so there is, you know, I mean, even when I went, when I saw Eddie about four years ago, when he came out here with the leeway NYC, you know, there was a there was a good amount of fans out there. You know that came out on the, on it was like a Wednesday night too. It was the middle of the week. You know, so I know you, you might not see it maybe you know as much as you think, but there are more fans I think of the band than than you realize. It's just, um, and I think this this documentary, like I said, we've been waiting. You know, as fans, we've been waiting for something like this for a long time. With something on the band, someone to do something, and I'm glad you did it, man. And uh, I just encourage everyone to go check it out. And uh, yeah, any last thing you want to say, Mike, before we wrap this up? Uh, again, appreciate you coming on and talking about it. Um, just, I just want to say thanks for having me, Matt. Of course, and uh, all the fans that are out there, if you know that are that are going to tune into this podcast, uh, I really appreciate you hanging on all these years and supporting the band all these years. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I always loved the fan base. I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, well, and and I really, I really want yeah. to say thanks to everybody. Yeah, no, and thanks, Mike, and we appreciate it, man. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll on behalf uh, of the band because I know the the rest of the band feels the same way.